Hey y'all, I'm James Wright. Welcome to my shop. And today we are making a pentagonal dovetailed bowl. <gasps> yeah, it's only taking me about seven years to finish this one. Let's dive in. So last time we left off with, uh, I don't know what I did wrong. And talking to a bunch of people and experimenting and playing with lots of other pieces, uh, we finally figured out what the problem is. So when I set the saw up to do a five-sided box, it cuts them at 126 degrees, which would make a five-sided box. However, I'm not mitering the corners. I'm causing them to overlap. So just like if it were a 90 degree box, I would cut them at 90 degrees. I wouldn't cut them at 45 degrees. So in this case, I want to actually set the miter to 108 degrees. That happens to be a 10 sided box. However, we're putting a bevel on this. So this is currently set up as the number five or the five sided miter. What I want is I want it to actually be at a 10. Now this doesn't have a 10 on here. And also I'm not cutting them vertical, so I don't want it set at 10. I actually want to keep it set at five, but in doing so, there's only one splay angle that will work at. And the angle I had it on back here is not the right angle. I actually need to push it up to about this angle. 61.7 degrees is what I want. So if this splay is at 61.7 and I'm set at five, then it will give me exactly what I want. If I want the splay at any other angle, then I have to change this to find out where that new angle would be. And that's a lot of math. Now, the easy answer is if I'm making a compound cut, it's nice to have a compound angle miter saw. But most miter saw boxes won't tip. They're just a simple miter box. Um, so if I wanted to adjust the splay angle to be something else, it's easy to go get a compound miter saw. But then you're working with a compound miter saw and you're taking all the fun of it. And part of what I want to do here is do it with the standard miter saw. So if I set it at 61.7 degrees of a fleam, then I can cut it at a five-sided box. And it all makes sense. Weird. So to kind of clarify it, if I'm making a 90 degree box, I cut my ends at 90 degrees. If I'm making a miter box, I would cut it 45 degrees. However, if I'm going to do an angled dovetail and make this a compound angle where the other compound is still keeping at 90 degrees, then I would actually cut these at 45 degrees and those 45 degree bevels would come together. It would be very confusing, but that only works if these are splayed at 45 degrees. If these are splayed at any other angle, then that bevel angle I would cut on here would be different. So it's the same thing with this. I have to find the same splay angle that matches the standard bevel angle for the box. A few people found the answer by making it in CAD, which normally I would probably go do that, but I wanted to figure it out myself. And I find that if I figure it out and find a way mathematically that makes it work, it clicks in my brain far easier. If I do it in CAD, I'll get the exact angles I need, but I won't know why I got it. And so that's why I'm trying to do it the hard way. I learn a little bit better that way. But that means that I'm going to make a few prototypes over the years and try different angles and find different things. And eventually we find one that works. So let's actually get into making a real pentagonal bowl. So this time we're going to use torrified curly maple. For those of you wanting to know, torrification is a process by which they take the wood and they heat it up past the point at which it would actually catch on fire, but they do so in an oxygen-free environment so that it cannot catch fire, and it goes a, under a chemical uh, change that turns it into this. So this is actually white maple, uh, hard maple, curly, but torrified, and it's a very odd texture to it, and it's kind of fun stuff to work with, but it's very, very stable. It does not expand yeah, and contract much. With. So basically, they take wood and they heat it up until the point it becomes torrified of catching on fire. Okay, let's get into this project. So I'm cutting these pieces. They're slightly thicker than a quarter inch. And now that I have the miter saw set up with the exact splay angle that will work at the proper miter angle, um, now we can actually make this work. <laughs> and this is actually my seventh attempt. I've been doing a bunch of these over the years, and it, this has been a fascinating thing to actually learn and wrap my brain around. And I love working on these projects that kind of put me out of my comfort zone and force me to learn something new in a different way. We need to make five of these, but I'm going to end up making seven of them. Why? Because sure shooting, I'm going to mess one of them up, and I'd rather not go back and change them all. So we're going to cut them all down, and hopefully there's enough in this piece to make it. And it's a little bit more. Okay, yeah, this one's actually going to work out. <laughs> this last piece is actually very difficult trying to hold it on the other side of the saw uh, and still run it. I ended up 
being lefty with it, which is okay with miter boxes. It's a kind of a good skill to learn for sawing individually, just being able to use the wrong hand. I want to go through and I mark every one of these. Each board is numbered, and then each number, little number below it tells me which board goes to either side of it. For making the dovetails, the first thing we need to do is make the depth cut. And I find it really easy to put the knife on one and just let it slide past the other one. It gives me a really nice deep um, cut in here. We're going to use dividers to lay it out. Now, I, I do have a couple videos going into making compound dovetails. Um, as I've been playing with this and learning the process, it is a fun one to wrap your brain around. And once you understand some of the basics that it's just a simple dovetail, it's just rather than using uh, rather than using two squares, you're using two bevel gauges. And uh, you wrap your brain around that. Uh, and, and the other thing I learned, this is my seventh attempt, is I have a pattern maker's vice. And anytime you're doing weird, wonderful angles, a pattern maker's vice is fantastic. However, I didn't get that to click in my brain until after I was making about halfway through this one. And so about halfway through this, you'll see me switch from my regular end vice that I do everything in to going over to the pattern maker's vice because it made this so much easier. And I wish I had tried that on attempt two or three, not attempt seven. For the dovetails, it's basically the same as anything else. We're going to be marking them out, cutting them down, removing the waste. Uh, particularly this, this one where we're cutting at a weird angle. You start on the acute side being up, and you punch it down at 90 degrees rather than following the bevel angle. Then you can flip it over and match those bevels from one to the other. And I can take this back until I match that bevel angle. And I can take it from the line right behind the chisel to go straight down until I touch the point. The very point at the bottom is right where I want it to be. So I'm staying away from that as long as I can. Then we can come in with a file, smooth them out, and detail them, get them right up to where we want. Now, these dovetails, this is the type of thing where you're going to have to do this a lot before you get a perfect cut. And now I can get a really, really good tight fit, um, I would say about 25% of the time. So this is, this is definitely a skill building exercise. So don't be afraid of gaps. They're going to happen. It's okay. It's part of the learning process. Now we're going to go about transferring the lines from the tails onto the pins. And I found this really easy to actually stick it in the vise and have it a little below the edge of the vise so that it will create a ledge for the tail to poke into. And then I can use the bevel gauge to draw down what would be a square line on regular ones. And in this case, it is par it's parallel to the top and bottom. So I'm cutting perfectly vertical. I'm just turning it two different directions on top. So the third direction is um, actually still vertical up and down. Um, and again, one of those odd things to wrap your brain around. Again, I'm starting on the acute side, and I'm going to take that um, back to the line and chop vertically at this point. That way when I flip it over, I can play connect the dots from the line on the back to the little piece left over. I am leaving as much on there as I can so that it doesn't break out quite as much. Uh, there is still a little bit of breakout, but that's okay. We're kind of uh, marching through these. If I really wanted to make perfect dovetails, I could do this uh, much. Uh, uh, I could take far more time at this. And I may in the future actually go back and do this project again and really take my time on it. Uh, at this point, I'm just trying to make one that actually works. And this one will have a lot of gaps in it because I'm just... I want to make it. <laughs> I've been trying to do this so many times, and it's one of those things that I, I just want to actually see this come together. Because there are still other steps on this. How do I put in a drawer bottom, a groove onto this that holds a bottom for it? How do I flatten out the top and bottom on this? Uh, there are lots of little steps that I know in my brain, and I just need to actually work through. There you can see I'm filing again, but I filed a little bit too far into the corner. Um, if I had been taking my time, I would have stayed out of that um, so or used a square file so that I wouldn't be running into that. But yeah, you live and you learn, and then you adjust your technique and make it a little bit better in the future. No one is perfect, and this is a, a great way to, um, to find that out. <laughs> so we're, one of the, uh, the the fiddling time on this is, is just getting that last fit. I don't want these to be crazy tight. I want them to be... Um, I want them to, to go together because if they are really tight, you're going to be splitting this out, especially with the torrified maple. It's very, very brittle stuff. And getting this together, look, hey, it's actually at the right angle. It fits into a pentagon at the bottom. We did it. So we've got all of the angles correct. Now we just need to do this again four more times. Happy day. <laughs> so uh, with the, uh, the magic of uh, kitchen show technology, um, I did the other four offhand, and there is our box. I have to put the groove inside. 
I have to cut a piece for that. Ooh, before I cut the piece though, I need to know what size it is. So let's do that first. That measurement, top to bottom, is two, six, nine, so I'm gonna two, say two, seven. Normally I would try banging my head against the wall and drawing this out by hand. And there are a bunch of great math ways of drawing out a pentagon, but I find that MS Print is absolutely phenomenal for printing things to scale and size. Okay, so uh, it's very, very quick and easy to adjust them and print it out and it's done. And yeah, just like that, I have a, a pentagon. And so I need to find exactly what the right very, very size close. is. This is the size at the bottom, but I need it to be bigger because it needs to house into a groove around the bottom. So I'm gonna add a little bit of material onto the pentagon cut that one out and see how it fits. Uh, but to Let's know where it fits into this, I put it on a cup, flip the cup side down and, and fit it down on there. And I figured that's about the right size. Um, I, in retrospect, I need to make it a little bit bigger because it actually needs to go into the groove, not just sit on the edge of the groove. Now, for my first attempt, yes, this is gonna take multiple attempts, I'm gonna be using regular maple. Uh, this is actually a, a curly maple. Uh, it's the exact same wood that these sides are made out of, so you can see what happens to the torification. It goes from this bright white into that golden color. And as with most of my projects, um, when I'm experimenting and play with it, this is not the only one I'm gonna make. Uh, because, yeah, this isn't quite right. It's ever so slightly small. Um, but it's a good way to learn, and don't be afraid to mess up. You're, you're gonna make mistakes, and you're gonna learn along the way. So we wanted to take this down to make it exactly the same as the pattern uh, when I should have actually made it about an eighth inch bigger on all sides than the pattern. I can bring in my gauge and check and make sure each corner is correct. I pick one of these as the correct side and then I take one of them to be the right angle from that and then I go to the opposite one and make that the right angle. And then I check the other two and make sure that they are all at the correct angle. Yeah. And now I know I have a perfect so pentagon happiness. <laughs> so uh, we need to fit it in here and see if it's going to work. And at this point I'm thinking, yeah, it's, it's probably still going to work. Um, but we need to actually have a groove for it to go into. So how do you put a groove on a weird bottom? Yeah, and here you can see I realized, wait a second, I've got a, uh, a pattern maker's vise, and I can set the pattern maker's vise at the, the correct side. angle okay, that so that it's really easy to flatten off the bottom of this. And originally I was thinking about putting it on a piece of sandpaper and flattening it all out as a piece, or if I had a disc sander, I could put it up against that. But if the vise is tipped to the right angle, I just hold the plane flat and I let my muscle memory know when it's at the the correct the angle the and I made it very very quick and easy to put that in then I to cut the groove I can set my groove on my 45 and I change the angle of the vise one more time and my fence can ride against that smooth bottom Not in quite, the groove actually. and it actually works I'm really really mm. happy with this and uh, this is something I have been thinking about for years trying to figure out exactly how I would put a groove into the angle at the bottom of this and hold it together and I figured I'd give this a try. I didn't think it would work, um, but in reality it worked perfectly as long as the vise was tipped to the right angle. Um, I don't know how I would do it without a pattern maker's vise. One of these ended up being ever so slightly off because my dovetails were um, spaced differently, so one of them is tipped light slightly. So I had to take a little more material so that the bottom would fit into it. And we can clean that up with a file, get rid of all of the, the junk at the bottom. And it looks weird because the bottom groove uh, is parallel to now the bottom of the bowl, uh, but at a weird angle to the splay of the bowl. Uh, but surprisingly, it was very, very, um, this is one of those steps that just, it was so pleasing to see it actually come together. And when I fit all this in, and there was a bottom in there, and it was fitting into the groove, it was just so exciting. But at this point, you can see that it's not quite fitting into the groove, um, because it needs to be a little bigger. Oops, well, um, let's learn and, and, and move on. Uh, so let's make a whole new bottom. And this time, um, I'm gonna, I, I didn't quite like the look of the maple against the torification. And I was thinking, maybe I'll put a piece of torrified maple in there. But then I had this, this piece of walnut, and I thought, this looks good. The walnut is really, really nice. So I'm going to cut down a strip of that. It's a bit thick, so that means I'm going to have to take it down to, to the correct thickness. Um, but, uh, yeah. Oh, and when, uh, when cutting, be careful not to, uh, to break the wood. Thankfully, it broke um, well below where it needed to be, so I, I could still have a piece out of it. But uh, it was still kind of a surprise, which shouldn't be because I was cutting it in an odd way in the vise. So, on to the next problem. I trimmed this one down to the thickness of the iron. 
uh, it's a great way to actually make sure that your boards get to the right thickness. You use the iron that cuts the groove to put alongside and you know how thick it needs to be. Unfortunately, I didn't realize that I had grabbed the wrong iron. The correct iron was still in the plane. Uh, so, oops. Uh, so I'm going to have to come back down and thin this off later. I'm going to do the exact same steps I did with the other one on this one and just make sure that everything is at the appropriate angle and I have an exact pentagon on here uh, until I go and put it in the groove and realize that it doesn't fit. And then I had the problem of, okay, how exactly do I plane down this small piece uh, and then I can't clamp it between two pieces because it is a corner. So I figured I'd put it in the corner and hold it on here. And it was sliding all over the place, and I was having difficulty with it. I was saying, wait, wait, I've got a, I've got a fix for this. <laughs> double-sided tape. Uh, anytime I'm working with small pieces, double-sided tape just comes to the rescue every time. It is one of those invaluable things in the shop that I use constantly, uh, especially on, on small things like this where I can just push it up against the stop lock it in and plane away and it just it works and that makes me very yeah, so very happy the and then after that we can pop it off put it into the groove and see how she fits because at this point everything is built we just need to actually get it all together there you can see i'm actually using the iron to check its thickness and how they hold on happy <laughs> and now we play the game of wiggling it together uh, because each of these has a tail on one side and a pin on the other uh, it takes a good bit of wiggling and you got to kind of work around it in spirals and you take one joint and you squeeze it a little bit and you go on to the next joint and you squeeze it a little bit and you just keep going around in circles until it all fits in there and then there's always one that's just not wanting to push in all the way um, and that's why they make clamps so now for the dangerous part we're going to glue this up and i am going to be using um, a total boat epoxy I, I love the high performance total boat epoxy uh, and one of the big reasons is because it gives me a lot of open time this is a lot more time than i'm gonna get with any wood glue and it works out really really well for this um, also it's very good at gap filling and there are going to be lots of gaps in this um, and I was originally thinking i'm gonna add a little bit of color into it to show off those gaps uh, but when the torrified wood um, it gets oil on it, it gets very, very, very dark. But one of the nice things about it is it acts as a great lubricant, so pushing this all together with the epoxy was phenomenal. I was trying to figure out how exactly am I going to clamp this all in place, and uh, Luke uh, gave me a hand, and I realized I'm going to need a couple more. So he ended up actually setting the camera down so he can get the strap wrapped around this, and this picture frame strap worked phenomenally well for this. I wish I had one to clamp the bottom as well, but this one worked out worked out fairly well. Um, you can see this one is pretty gappy, and that's my, my worst side there where you can see a lot of schmoo on that. Um, I, I just loaded up the joints with it and realized I'm going to be working it off. Uh, I, I wanted to make something that was functional as opposed to make something that was perfect. And I'm not actually going to go through and, and clean them off. This is that one joint that was off slightly, so I had to tr shave it down a little bit. For removing epoxy, the best thing for it is a card scraper. It does amazingly well. It doesn't clog up the sandpaper. You're not going to be getting uh, water into the wood then. Uh, it's, it's just a, a great way to do it, and it cuts through it very, 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 very quickly. Next, I decided I did want to actually fill the drawer bottom groove holes. Most of the time, I don't want to do that. But in this case, I decided, let's go ahead and do it. So I'm going to be using some CA glue, and I've just chopped these off with a chisel until they are of the appropriate angle. And these were some really weird ones to try and fit into the shape. Put in a little bit of CA glue, hit it with some activator, and then we can come back through and trim them off. I'm doing this before doing the final planing, so that when I plane it all, they all are nice and smooth, and it cleans off everything. And I was actually very, very happy with it. Um, one of the nice things about plugging those is you can match the end grain of the board to the end grain you're using, and they come up very, very well. Now, because I'm going to be doing wild grain, torrified curly maple is some of the most difficult stuff to get truly smooth. Uh, this plain iron has to be set up with an inch of its life, and it's going to take a lot to make it perfect. And I ended up having to sharpen it a couple times in order to make this uh, really nice and smooth. But it's amazing what you can do with a perfectly set up hand plane that does smoothing very, very well. And you can come in and take off everything and bring it down to this smooth shape. And up until this point, you're looking at this absolute mess with glue everywhere and joints that aren't perfect. And at this point, it's 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 really coming together, and I am. I'm loving this. <laughs> it's, it's actually working. Um, you can see here there are some gaps around it, but it actually doesn't look half bad. 
to trim the bottom, um, I was able to flip it over and use some hold fast to kind of pinch a corner a bit and then push it up against a stop in the jaw. And this worked very, very well to be able to plane it, run around it. For the, the, the top, I wasn't able to find a way to clamp it. Uh, so I'm using a block plane and then ended up not liking the block plane because it was giving me far more chip out. So I sharpened my smoothing plane again and I went around the bowl uh, this way to give a nice clean joint. And I ended up doing one section at a time until they all came out nicely. Then we can use the block plane to add a slight chamfer to get rid of that ultra sharp corner on the, the top. And it's basically done. I'm going to be hitting it with a little bit of sandpaper as I want the, uh, the, the pores to soak up as much um, oil as possible. Um, I want it to kind of match the epoxied uh, look. And it does that very, very well. So just some 400 grit sandpaper, not a whole lot. Um, <laughs> with torrified wood, you kind of wonder which way should I go, up and down or side to side, because the Chateauian Sea goes the other direction. But uh, it comes out pretty well. So how exactly am I going to finish this? Boiled linseed oil and paste wax. Uh, actually, in the end, I ended up putting a coat of shellac on it afterwards. I thought, mm, let's give it a try for that. But the way this just pops out, uh, in, in the video, it does tend to look a little bit green. In person, it is just absolutely gorgeous. It has a beautiful golden color to it. And the chatoyancy just explodes in this. I love the curly maple and seeing how all those tiger stripes come out. Uh, this was a very, very pleasing project, and I was very happy with how the epoxy seams just disappeared on this. It actually made it look like the joints were relatively tight. So, yeah, <laughs> really, really happy with how this came out, and uh, who knows, maybe I'm going to try it again and, and do a, a perfect version of it in the future. But for right now, uh, I think I've had enough of this. So there you have it. Uh, yes, this has taken me quite a few tries. Uh, this is the seventh attempt, in, and most of them have been in the last year. However, my first attempt was about seven years ago. Uh, this is a really um, surprisingly fun one to do. It's a great one to wrap your brain around, and making angled dovetails, compound angled dovetails, is very difficult, but very rewarding. Um, and this one it has a lot of gaps and a lot of imperfections, and I kind of like that. It really came out a lot better than I was expecting. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really, really happy with this thing. So yes, um, I always, I love trying different things, things that stretch my skills in different ways and trying something that I've never tried before. And this is definitely one of those. If you want to give this a try, I would love to see the pictures you make of yours um, because it is a surprisingly difficult one, but it is a lot of fun. As well, if you want to see the last attempt, I have a video for that um, showing me failing at it. Uh, so you can go and take a look at that. And I have a detailed live video on making compound dovetails. So if you want to do that as well, I'll leave a link to those down below. So if you have any questions, thoughts, ideas, things I could have done better, let me know those. I love listening to those. Um, honestly, I learn a lot from the comments and it means more than I can say because it does actually help out the channel. Every comment you put down below is worth having 10 likes. And if you share it, that's worth having 10 comments. So thank you. On top of that, there are a bunch of names over here. Those are all of the fantastic, wonderful, benevolent, and gorgeous people over on Patreon. Without patrons or members who clicked the join button down below or the thank you button, uh, we wouldn't be here. We are completely sponsored by you. And without you guys, um, we wouldn't exist. So if you'd like to help out with that and keep the channel going, think about becoming a patron or becoming a member here on YouTube. We have special perks for both, and I think that'll do it for now. Until next time, have a wonderful day. So next up, we're going to make a dovetailed soccer ball. This one took seven years. That one's going to take um, a little longer. <laughs>